I'm going to split the lecture really kind of into two parts. And those of you who have the PDFs already see a break in the middle. Basically, so the first part is everything you want to know more about, take the virology class in the spring. And then the second part is trying to cover a couple things, a work that's being done in my lab, and then this you know, funky virus that's circulating in West Africa. And probably much more importantly, a virus which is circulating here right now. So generally, what I'm going to try and do is use this pointer over here, just because that's something that's going to show up on the YouTube video as opposed to this laser pointer, which I have a nasty tendency to overuse. Um, first, my apologies to those of you who have already seen this, um, but I think it's a really good introduction for um, sort of why I care about viruses. Oops, if I actually can get that to work now. Here we go. This is a documentary film that I'm working on on viruses, for those of you who haven't heard about this already. Um, and this is the trailer for it. Um, that's not going to help. It's not going to help. No. Okay, we can try this. It's not going to help with the recording. At least on this planet, there are more viruses, 10 to 100 times more viruses than there are of anything else. I love the sound effects in deep space. It's always good fun. <laughs> this is my main field site, Lassen Volcanic National Park. And that's a place called Boiling Springs Lake. I'll talk about some viruses from there later on. Don't do this at home. Extra credit for people who know where that is. Hi, I'm Dr. Ken Stedman from Portland State University, the Center for Life and Extreme Environment. And ignore this coming soon part here. <laughs> 
because um, as usual with most of these projects, um, including science and film, it always takes longer than you think it's going to. So uh, that's where we stand in here. So let's maybe back up a little bit and talk a little bit about what is a virus. And unfortunately, this is not a really easy question to answer. If you look at your textbook, and in fact most textbooks, they would say it's a very small, and again, anybody in my molecular biology or virology classes knows anytime I put something in quotes, it means probably don't believe it, um, infectious obligate intracellular parasite. That's actually the obligate intracellular parasite is pretty good. I like this one, simply a piece of bad news wrapped up in a protein uh, by Nobel laureate Peter Medivar. Um, this, I think, is fun, but it turns out that it sort of was mentioned a little bit in that video. A lot of viruses probably are not bad news at all, and in some cases they're clearly good news as well. Patrick Fortier, a um, good colleague of mine, just calls them capsid encoding organisms. And so this gets back to some other questions about whether viruses are alive, and we'll need a couple of beers to drink before we can discuss that. But my favorite definition of a virus is very simply a bag of genetic material. It's a very specialized bag, and it's very specialized genetic material. But that's basically all that it is. Doesn't say it's very small. Doesn't say that it's particularly bad. Um, it's just that bag of genetic material. And basically, after I came up with this, I also found this definition, also Nobel laureate Salvador Luria, who I think, at least for me, is kind of a long definition, but it is viruses are entities whose genomes are elements of nucleic acid that replicate inside living cells using the cellular synthetic machinery and causing the synthesis of specialized elements that can transfer the viral genome into other cells. So, Again, genomes of nucleic acid, so that's your bag of nucleic acid, bag of genes that have to use cellular machinery to replicate, so they've got to get inside another cell in order to make more virus, and then can transfer that genetic material from one cell to another. So the way your textbook shows this is basically here. You have a, remember to use this pointer, um, the virion, which is the extracellular part of the virus, which then interacts with the host. This is the attachment step. This is something which is pretty specific to viruses, although, as we'll see a little bit later on, most viruses use parts of the outside of the cell that lots of other things use as well. On the other hand, this is a pretty specific aspect, this second step, which is getting that nucleic acid inside the cell, also known as the penetration step, synthesis of nucleic acid and protein. This is actually basically identical to what happens normally inside the cell with a couple of variations, but it's because of this process right here in the middle. That's why a lot of people have studied viruses in the first place. We know a lot about how microbial proteins and nucleic acid are made based on what we learned from looking at viruses. Same thing is true for humans. We know a lot about how we have transcription, translation, replication from studying viruses, because they do this. They use all the cellular machinery to do this. On the other hand, putting viruses together, this is something which is really specific to viruses, and then viruses get out of the cell as well. So I should say, and again, I'm just as bad about this as most people, this really should be here virions, because I like to think of this as really a whole cycle. It's a virus life cycle. So most people, tell, when they talk about viruses, they talk about the virions. This is just this little extracellular part of the whole viral life cycle. These are these typical virions. You've got two main flavors of viruses, either the naked viruses or the enveloped viruses. And the only difference here is that they've got membranes around the outside in terms of enveloped viruses, and no membranes around the outside as far as naked viruses are concerned. Again, this is the bag, also known as the capsid, and then the nucleic acid, the genome that's present on the inside. And again, as a reminder, I love this quote from Patrick Voltaire, ceci n'est pas un virus. Um, anyone know what that's a reference to? This is in Cecilia Pazan Pip from René Magritte, a famous surrealist painter. But basically, the idea here again is that 
This is just the extracellular form of the virus. It's that whole process, getting inside the cell, making more of the virions and getting back out. That's the whole virus life cycle. So that's what viruses are. What about where you find them? Well, this again is a, a picture from your text. And basically, if you go to any environment, this particular example is from seawater, but soil, actually air, the air that we're currently breathing, you see basically exactly the same thing. If you just take that material and stain it with a nucleic acid binding stain, it binds to DNA and or RNA, and then fluoresces, and then look at this under a fluorescent microscope, what you'll see are a bunch of dots. What's been shown quite nicely by Jed Furman, among other people, is that these big dots here are the boring bacteria and archaea. The exciting ones are all the little dots. All of these are virions. And it should be really obvious from this slide that there are way more of the little dots than there are the big dots. And so, therefore, the viruses are way more important than you know, all those other little things which are in there. But don't tell Anna Louise. Um, but <laughs> uh, but one of the really fascinating things about, again, all these little dots is if you add them up, you get to some really ridiculous numbers. Um, this is just another image also from Jed Furman over on the side. I like this one because it's got one poor lonely eukaryote that's in here. It's a diatom. And again, everything else in here, the big dots are bacteria and archaea. Maybe some nanoarchaea in there, too. Uh, and then the little dots are all viruses. Uh, you just look at the oceans, anywhere between a million and 10 million virus particles per mil. Same thing is true if you look at what comes out of our backside. Um, also per gram, 10 to the 6, 10 to the 7. Again, millions to 10 millions per milliliter or cubic centimeter in this particular case. Add all these things up, you get to 10 to the 31 virus particles. Now that's insane. That's an absolutely ridiculous number. And just to give you an idea, if you lined all these guys up end to end, they would be about 20 million light years long. And that's just what's present on our planet. So there's some really ridiculous numbers of virions now, which are presumably have gone through this whole life cycle, that are now present on Earth. What are they doing? We actually don't really have a very good clue be perfectly honest. So as Anna Louise mentioned, we don't know very much about microbes. We know even less about the viruses. But there are a couple of things that are really important about these massive numbers. And the main one that I'll get back to, we've got time later today, is that really infrequent events, so one in a million, one in a million, when you've got 10 to the 31, that happens a lot. It happens really frequently. And so these really unusual events happen with a very high frequency, relatively speaking. These things do happen, even if they're really pretty rare. Where do you find viruses? Not just in the oceans. Turns out that our genome is packed with viruses. Okay, it depends on how you define them. But basically, if you look at this, this is from molecular biology of the cell, but basically in the human genome, clearly 8% of our genome, and this is everything, coding, non-coding sequences, you name it, is clearly viral. Depends on how you do your definitions. If you talk about line and sign elements, up to 40% of our genome is viral. That's a heck of a lot, particularly if you compare it to the 1.5%, which are protein coding genes. So we're more virus than we are human, which I think is a really interesting thing to think about. So what are these, what are these things doing here? Are they just junk? Well, it turns out that a number of these viral genes which have integrated into our genome are really important for some processes that we think are really, really important. And my favorite one here is motherhood. Why? Well, it turns out that there's a particular gene, actually a whole family of genes called syncytions, and basically what they do is they allow cell fusion to take place. It turns out these are all viral proteins. And they're absolutely required for placental development. If the ancestor of all current mammals were not infected by some of these viruses, we wouldn't have motherhood as we know it. 
So I think viruses are kind of important. Now, who cares about all these, you know, photogenic macrofauna? It's true also for all the microbes that are out there as well. Hopefully you've seen a tree like this. Yes? Yeah, kind of, sort of. You all remember exactly what this is all about. It's all about the small subunit RNA sequence. And basically, this is a way of looking at cellular life. And the main take-home message here is that, yeah, it's mostly microbial. So that's why microbiology, apart from virology, is probably the most important class you'll ever take. Um, but of all of those organisms, every single one of them has viruses or viruses associated with them. So again, I think a reason to be very interested in looking at virology. So as I mentioned before, there are a couple things about viruses which are really specific and you only find in viral life as opposed to cellular life. And the first of those is that we've got very different structures. So all of these structures up here don't look like anything you find outside of viruses. They've got these sort of soccer ball-like structures, partly why I brought my soccer ball over there. Um, also these helical structures. Again, you don't see this anywhere outside of the virions. And part of the reason for this is that the way these guys fit together gets to that bag of nucleic acid idea. Usually, these bags are pretty small. If you've got a small bag, you can't put much nucleic acid inside. If you can't put much nucleic acid on the inside, then you've got to be very careful about how you design your bag. And basically, for, I would say, at least of the viruses we know, 90-odd percent of them, smaller is better. And what that means is, again, you want to have a small amount of nucleic acid. Nucleic acid is really inefficient in terms of how you code things. And, you know, you think about the DNA that's in one cell of your body, you stretch it out, it's longer than you are. So it's a really inefficient process for coding information. So the viruses, they've got to make these structures to make that bag. They want to do it in as simple way as possible. And there are basically sort of two really simple ways of doing that. One is this one, which is used by the Mac mosaic virus and a number of other viruses, which is a helical symmetry. Basically, you take your individual subunits, and you line them up next to each other, and each one can stack on top of the other one in a basically identical fashion, going all the way up along your nucleic acid that you're packaging inside this bag. That's one way to do it. Another way to do it, which is why I brought my soccer ball here, is sort of the soccer ball approach. And the idea here is that, just geometrically speaking, the simplest way to get the largest volume for the smallest surface area is a sphere. How do you get a sphere with repeating subunits? An icosahedron. And so that is how most viruses that we know of end up doing their packaging. They have one or a few different proteins that they use to make this bag. Make an icosahedral bag, again, out of a relatively few number of proteins. Uh, one of the neat things about icosahedra is that they're completely symmetrical. If you look at various different dimensions here, again, I like my soccer ball because it's much nicer in three dimensions, but <clears throat> here it's a five-fold axis of symmetry. Anywhere you've got a nice five-fold pointed star, you rotate this 72 degrees, you end up with exactly the same thing. You also have three-fold axes of symmetry, which is where you look down at one of these hexagons, 120 degrees each time you end up with the same thing. Or you have a two-fold axis of symmetry, you rate it 180 degrees, you end up with exactly the same thing. So an incredibly symmetrical structure, which again, you can put together with very few individual pieces. So you're not having to package too much of this nucleic acid inside that bag. There are, of course, exceptions. It's biology. There are always exceptions to things, particularly when you look at the structures of some of these enveloped viruses. Here on the left-hand side, we have influenza. It's a classic enveloped virus. Turns out on the inside of influenza, you actually have helical packaging of your nucleic acids. And here on the other side is vaccinia. This is the smallpox vaccine. It's one of the largest viruses that people knew about until 
very recently, um, which packages its DNA actually rather similarly to the way that we package our DNA, with proteins that then get those packaged into a smaller case. So that was the one thing that's very different about viruses. It's this structure. It's the bag. The second thing is what's on the inside. Many viruses, probably the majority of viruses, have double-stranded DNA that they use for their genome on the inside. The, bat, the nucleic acids inside that bag, they're double-stranded DNA. Now, that's true, of course, for cells, bacterial cells, eukaryotic cells, archaeal cells, etc. But the thing that makes these viruses different is that a lot of them use different kinds of nucleic acid for their genome. There are viruses that use single-stranded DNA as parts of their genome, those that use double-stranded RNA, single-stranded RNA, and single-stranded RNA that either is coding, i.e. you can use it directly for translation, or the opposite strand of RNA, also known as the negative strand RNA. And then there's some really bizarre viruses that have inside the bag RNA, but they have to make double-stranded DNA as part of this whole life cycle of the virus. These are the so-called retroviruses. All viruses that we found to date, and actually to some extent it's a bit of a definition of viruses, use cellular translation machinery. No virus to date has been found with its own ribosome. Partly why it wasn't on that tree that I showed you a couple of minutes ago in terms of cellular life. So they all have to make messenger RNA. They all have to make positive strand RNA to make their proteins. So they all have different ways of doing that. Double-stranded DNA, making messenger RNA, single-stranded DNA, et cetera. And we'll talk about a couple of examples of each of these um, in the next couple of minutes. So again, this is the process down the bottom. You have attachment followed by getting that genome inside the cell, making more of both the bag and the genes, putting them all together, and getting out. So how do we study these kinds of things? Basically, we do something called a one-step growth curve. If you care more about one-step growth curves, take the virology course. We'll talk a lot more about them. But basically, this is looking at how one virus replicates, but the only way to do that is to look at lots of viruses at the same time. So basically what happens is you have infection, and then this would be sort of the first two steps that we had on the last one. So this process right here, attachment and entry. Then after that, you have what's called the latent period. And this latent period is really unique as far as viruses are concerned and how they replicate. Because if you think about how bacteria replicate, how other cells replicate, it's always one cell goes to two cell, goes to four cells. And sometimes some of those will die in the process. But for viruses, the way they replicate, one virion goes to zero virions, goes to many virions. So it's a completely different way of, of replicating in terms of thinking about how this process takes place. So you start out here with one virus, goes to zero viruses, and then up at the top here goes to many viruses. This is really the interesting part, as far as I'm concerned and as far as you know, most virologists are concerned, at least the molecular virologists, is what goes on when you have zero viruses. And that is this process right here. How are you making the different parts of that bag of nucleic acid. There's a couple of different things that usually happen here. The so-called early enzymes that we'll look at how those work. Usually these are the very first things that the cell makes when the virus has an infection. And sometimes these are actually enzymes that the virus brings with it. We'll talk about some of those examples a little bit later on. Then the genes, the nucleic acid, which is inside the bag, gets made. Then you make the bag and then you get out. So some of you may have noticed here on the y-axis, relative virus count. How do you count viruses? Well, most of them are really small. You can go downstairs to the electron microscope and try and count them individually that way. It's a real pain. So um, people have worked out techniques to do this. And these are called plaque assays. So this is also known as a plaque-forming unit. What's a plaque? 
Well, a plaque is a region usually on a lawn of cells, so a whole bunch of cells, some of which have been killed by a virus infection, or in some cases just the growth has been slowed down by that. So what we're looking at here, noted by the arrows here, are each of these areas right here. So if hopefully you can see that dot. Yeah, the projector's okay here. Um, so you can see that one dot represents one virus infection event that took place. Now, how do you do this kind of experiment? Basically, you take a whole bunch of bacteria. So everything that's in the back here, these are all bacteria that haven't been infected by viruses that are growing just perfectly happily. And then you have a few, relatively small number, in this case, in the order of about 100 phage or viruses that you mix together, put onto a regular auger plate, together with something that stops the cells and viruses from moving too far. So put them together, let everything grow. If the bacteria are happy, which is what you see here, they're going to grow normally. You'll see nothing. On the other hand, if there's a virus infection, that is going to infect the first cell that was there. That then is going to make more virions that are going to infect the cells next to it, which are going to make more virions and infect the cells next to it as well. So you should get a nice circle around where you had that first virus infection that took place. Um, this, of course, is really pretty because what's in the textbooks. This is something that I made uh, <clears throat> a couple months ago now. Um, this is back to HT4 that we'll be seeing um, some images of a little bit later on. This is what I call TMTC. What's TMTC? Too many to count, exactly. Uh, turns out that this particular prep of bacteriophage T4 had 1 billion virus particles per milliliter, so 10 to the 9, um, which is not unusual at all for the numbers that you get in some of these things. Here's a slightly better plaque assay that I did. This is a virus called Phyx-174 that we'll be looking at in just a second. One of the things to note here is that you get much bigger plaques in this particular case, different virus. Different viruses are going to produce different plaques, and this depends on the rate that the virus is being made, how fast the viruses are growing, how fast the host cells are growing. Turns out that this particular virus, Phyx-174, makes more virus particles in about 12 minutes. So it's a really, really rapid process from infection to making new virions. You can also do the same thing with animal cells. Um, this is a case here, I forget which particular virus you're looking at here. Same kind of thing, you have cells growing on a surface, you put in small amounts of virus, those then cause some kind of phenotype that you can actually visualize later on. At first I thought doing bacterial virus plaques was a pain, then I tried to do some of this, way harder, <laughs> although we're working on some of that later on. So, this gives you an idea how many virus particles you actually have in your particular preparation. So that allows you to actually start studying those individual viruses and what they're doing. So what's the first step you have to do if you're a virion? What do you need to do? You need to attach to things. What do you attach to? Well, basically, anything that's on the outside of a cell. So these are just some examples here of bacterial viruses, what they bind to on the exterior, and in this particular case, it's an E. coli cell, gram-negative. It's got these two membranes right here. So you have viruses, not important which ones, that bind to flagella. You have viruses that bind to pili. You've got viruses that bind to iron transport proteins. You've got viruses that bind to the lipopolysaccharide on the outside. Basically, anything that's on the outside of a cell, it appears that you've had through billions of years of evolution, viruses that can then interact with those individual cell surface proteins, carbohydrates, basically you name it, there's a virus that's going to associate with it. Now I'm going to talk about one virus in particular, one of my favorites, um, and that's bacteriophage T4. Um, here's your, your own little favorite giant microbes. You can get your very own. There's a problem with this. Actually, it turns out the head should be a little bit longer, but you know, so be it um, for giant microbes. So what does bacteriophage T4 do? Um, the T4 virion binds to the outside of the cell and then has this really amazing, almost like a syringe process 
where it takes the nucleic acid that's present on the inside and injects it through first the outer membrane of E. coli and then has some enzymes that will break down the inner membrane of E. coli to get this genome onto the inside of the cell. P4 bacteriophage has been studied for decades. Um, in fact, it's one of the very first bacteriophage to be studied on a very regular basis. Uh, your book says that the T stands for tail. That's wrong. Um, it actually stands for type, because this is the type 4 of the bacteriophages that they were looking at. How do they know what type it was? By looking at what kind of plaques it formed. So this was the fourth kind of plaque that this particular virus was working with. Anybody know where these viruses came from originally? Two different places, actually. Sewage treatment plant is one. This particular one came from a therapeutic mixture of viruses. So people used to use viruses to treat bacterial disease. Something called phage therapy that people are thinking about now with antibiotic resistant bacteria. That's all I'm going to mention now. You can Google phage therapy. There's a ton of stuff out on the web um, to actually take a look at it. But first I wanted to show this particular image <coughs> from Michael Rossman's lab um, looking at bacteriophage T4. And again, my apologies to those of you who have seen this before. But again, it's just too cool not to watch again. So this is your bacteriophage. This is actually correct uh, molecularly. It's an elongated head structure with this tail. And basically, this particular study was looking at how these proteins were involved in the attachment process. And then they you know, made this video to go with it. So here's your bacteriophage. Here's the poor unsuspecting E. coli that it's going to be interacting with. Um, binds to the lipopolysaccharide, which is on the surface, through these long tail proteins. There's that LPS. Once you have all of these bound, then you have this huge conformational change, which then has binding of these short tail fibers, injection through here, then these enzymes here, which break down the inner membrane. Now the genome is released, and you get replication of that particular virus. So what happens with that replication? You have replication of the genome. And this is bacteriophage T4 DNA. Sorry, I need to use the pointer over here. Uh, the genome here, just cartoon A through G, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And that's everything you need to make the T4 genome. There are actually about 300 genes in the genome, so not enough letters in the alphabet. But this is sort of the idea, is you've got A, B, C, D, E, F, G. But what's interesting is when people started to look at this genome using genetic mapping techniques, they found that the genome looked as if it was a circle. But they knew that that genome was actually packaged inside that big head as a linear piece of DNA. So how could they explain that? Turns out that the ends of the genome of bacteriophage T4 are what's called circularly permuted. And all that that means is, if you look at any given genome, so that's what's over here on the right-hand side of the slide, any given genome here packaged inside a bacteriophage T4 head has A, B, C, D, E, F, G in it. But where it starts, is a little bit different. And that has to do with the way that that nucleic acid gets put inside the head. And that process is what's called head full packaging. So what you do, you take your genome, which has now gotten linked together in one big, ginormous, long stretch of DNA, which just has copies of the genome, one after the other, and then chopped up one head full at a time. So you take one end, you put it into the head, gets to the end, that gets chopped off. You go find the next piece, it gets chopped off. And it turns out that for bacteriophage T4, that piece is slightly longer than the one whole genome that you have. So that gives you your circular permutation. 
Circular permutation is only one of the really fascinating things that was found out about the bacteriophage T4 genome. There are lots of other ones. Probably the most important have to do with virus defense mechanisms. I thought I'd bring these up here briefly. Um, the stuff at the top here, immunity, RNA interference, who cares about that? It's just macrobes. Uh, take immunology next term if you're interested in more about that. But much more importantly for microbes, there are two different systems which are used for protecting yourself against virus attack. One of them is actually not at all different from this acquired immunity process. It's called the CRISPR process. And hopefully you'll have a chance to talk about that later in the class. The clustered, regularly interspersed palindromic repeats. Horrible name, but that's what they came up with. But more importantly, at least as far as this lecture is concerned, are the so-called restriction modification systems. And this is a great example of how studying bacterial viruses and their resistance has revolutionized the way that we do biology. This is where all of your restriction into nucleases come from. If people hadn't studied bacterial resistance to virus infection, we wouldn't have biotechnology. Because it's all based on these restriction modification systems. So what's a restriction modification system? A restriction system restricts what viruses can infect what bacteria. And the way it does it is by having an endonuclease, which chops the DNA in little pieces. Whenever DNA comes in, you remember that penetration process. You have extra DNA coming inside the cell. If you chop it up into little pieces, there's no way it's going to be get made into more virus. So how do viruses deal with this? A couple of different ways. One is to inactivate those enzymes that will chop up the DNA that comes in. Some viruses do that. Bacteriophage T4 has a really interesting way of doing it. It basically says, forget normal DNA. I'm going to have modified DNA that I use. And so those endonucleases are not going to recognize it at all. All of the cytosines in the bacteriophage T4 genome are actually not cytosines at all. They're hydroxymethyl cytosine, which is cytosine with this big modification that happens on the side. All of you, of course, remember from molecular biology that base pairing happens over on this side. And whatever you do over here really doesn't make a huge difference, except for various DNA binding proteins, like endonucleases, which would chop up the genome. Turns out that this is such a smart thing to do, again, totally over-anthropomorphizing the viruses, that bacteriophage T4 chops up the host genome. It makes its own endonuclease that chops up everything at cytosines, because it doesn't use cytosines. So the enzyme that it makes chops up the host genome, but doesn't chop up its genome. So it ends up with this own specially modified DNA. So a bit of an overview, looking at this is just for the case of bacteriophage T4, but you see very similar things going on for practically any kind of virus. And if you're interested in those, again, take virology in the spring. Um, you have this infection process that we saw the video about. And then early proteins. And these early proteins are almost always involved in one of two different things. One is changing the host in some way. So as I mentioned for bacteriophage T4, what it does, chews up the host DNA because it's got its own modified DNA. Also modifies how host transcription takes place. But the other thing that these early proteins do is they usually make more of the viral genes. And so early proteins are involved in host modification and making more genome. You have these Middle proteins, you don't have those as much. Um, many of these are also involved in making more of the genome. And then the so-called late proteins, these are almost always involved in that last process, making the bag, putting together the capsid, getting everything together in order to get the whole process out here. Now at the bottom, this is a reminder, this all takes place in less than half an hour. So less than it takes time it takes to double as far as your E. coli, going from one cell to two cells. Um, bacteriophage 
can make more of itself, usually makes about 100 of these bacteriophage virions in that half an hour, which is really pretty amazing, just from the point of view of putting all this stuff together, but also means that if you want to study things like replication and transcription, it's all happening really fast. There's a whole bunch of it happening. So this is how a lot of people figured out how transcription, replication work in E. coli is by studying how it happens for T4 and then some of the modifications that go with that. Wanted to mention briefly this last step, which is virus specific, and that is putting the whole head structure together and getting the nucleic acid inside that bag. Um, again, something which is very specific to viruses, doesn't happen normally cellularly. Cellularly, excuse me. You have the head which gets put together, and then a motor protein, which literally pumps your genome inside this head. And you remember, it just goes through a head full. You pump everything inside the head, and it gets really, really full inside these heads. In fact, there's a bunch of uh, studies which have looked at the pressure which gets built up by the DNA, which gets packaged inside these head structures. Now, some of you may have seen, I didn't get the image here, but if you use an osmotic shock on one of these bacterial viruses, that head will burst, and you have this huge halo of DNA which is around it. Um, it's really pretty impressive. So this motor, ATP, burns a lot of ATP, packages your DNA on the inside, then you put the tail structure on it, and this virus then pops out of the cell, say virion, and again, you usually get about 100 of them per replication cycle. So that's the bacteria of HD4. Yeah? Yes, it's all host cell ATP. And um, in this particular case, um, this is an example of one of two ways that viruses can replicate. So we're getting a little bit ahead of ourselves here. Uh, but this is really bad for the cell. The cell doesn't survive this process. It gets blasted open, and all of the ATP, again, which it, it is made very carefully through glycolysis and the TCA cycle and all of that, the virus basically steals all of that and uses it just to make more virus particles. So um, there's that process. But there's also, and what happens in this case is that, that you know, those 100 virus particles, they burst open the cell. That cell is completely dead. Turns out that that process, killing off the cell that you've infected, is not a really good life strategy, life history strategy, because all viruses are dependent on getting inside a cell to make more virus. Well, if you just killed off this cell, how do you make more virus? So it works. There's a whole bunch of cells around and not too many virus. But I showed you those pictures. Remember, at the beginning, all little dots and very few big dots. Well, that's a problem if you depend on the big dots to make more little dots. So, most viruses actually use a different strategy. And this is what's called the lysogeny process. So most viruses are what are called temperate viruses. And that means that they hang out with their hosts for usually pretty long periods of time. And in some cases, even you know, well beyond your normal replication cycle. And you can also think of this as like the viruses in our genome. They're really kind of like these temperate viruses. They just hang out in our genome. Um, that's the virus. The cell which has one of these viruses in it is called a lysogen. And the process of getting the viral nucleic acid inside the cell and having it hang out there is something called lysogeny. And once you have the virus nucleic acid inside the cell, it's called either prophage or in many cases also provirus if you're looking at mammalian viruses as well. The best understood of these is the lambda bacteriophage. And that's an electron micrograph of the lambda bacteriophage right here. So what happens here? Lambda bacteriophage binds to the outside of a cell. It releases its genome inside the cell, just like any other virus. And then, at least for lambda, there's this decision that has to be made. Do you make a whole bunch more virions here, or do you hang out? Turns out that has to do with that whole process that I mentioned before, talking about the lytic cells. It's OK if there are a whole bunch of cells around that you can infect and make more virions. So if the cells are growing really happily, what happens is lambda does this. 
and it makes a whole bunch more virions, which can go and infect other cells. However, if the going's not so good, and there aren't a whole bunch of other cells around, the cells aren't growing really fast, then what happens is this so-called lysogenic pathway. Again, so this is you know, hanging out inside the cell. What happens is that the lambda genome gets integrated, it gets popped into the host genome, and now you have one of these prophages or proviruses. Every time now this cell replicates, another copy of that virus genome is made. And again, this is what's happened clearly in our genome. And it's true for almost all bacterial genomes that I've looked at, with a few exceptions. Uh, but pretty much all of these will have at least one, if not many, of these proviruses inserted into them. So this is perfectly fine for maintenance of this virus over long periods of time. But sometimes you need to go and infect another cell. How do you do that? This is a process called induction. Most people do this by ultraviolet irradiation of the cells. And then, basically, this process can be reversed, and you can undergo this lysis. Again, interested in more details, check it out online, or come take my virology class. This <clears throat> process of integrating the genome into the host is really interesting from a biochemical point of view, um, but also just in terms of looking at how the virus can undergo this particular process of basically hanging out. And again, most viruses in the environment probably undergo this same kind of process. For lambda, it's pretty well known. You have a linear genome, which is packaged inside that head structure that I showed you the micrograph of just a second ago. And this, once it gets inside the cell, turns out becomes circular really quickly. And we'll see why that's important in just a second. The way it does that is actually a lot like Restriction endonucleases, which cut and leave sticky ends. These are what are called cohesive ends. That's why they're called COS here. So these two ends come together. And then there's another DNA sequence on the viral genome called the AT site, or the attachment site. That's where the virus is going to attach to the host DNA, which is down here in blue, and put the virus genome into the host genome. Um, turns out it's very specific for bacteriophage lambda, something called the integrase site, which pops it in. For a lot of the retroviruses that we'll talk about in just a second, um, that, as it turns out, has a very non-specific way that it inserts itself into the genome. So here we have a specific insertion into the genome. Now, anytime this cell replicates its genome, it also replicates the virus genome. I did mention that we have a circular genome here. Why are circular genomes important? Well, it turns out circular genomes are really important for making more of the genomes. Lambda, when it replicates, undergoes a process called rolling circle replication, which is really unique to viruses. You don't see this happening in cellular replication. Um, but this has to do with the fact that all DNA polymerases go from 5 prime to 3 prime. They never go in the opposite direction. So what happens here is that you have one strand, in this case the negative strand. You remember positive is what codes for your DNA, negative is, uh, sorry, for your protein, negative is what doesn't code for that, which just serves as a template for your DNA polymerase. So here, DNA polymerase, RNA primers, and just extends. You see here's a three prime end. Anytime you have a three prime end and a template, DNA polymerases are real happy. So this DNA polymerase is just going to go and go and go and go and go and keep going around and around and around and around and around and make a whole big long copy of your genome. The opposite strand gets made by regular RNA primers, RNA primase, et cetera, and gives you this whole long double-stranded piece of many, many copies of your genome. That then gets chopped up at these cost sites. These are now very specific sites, which then gets packaged inside the bacteriophage head. So that's lysogeny, lysis. Let's look at a little bit of the viral zoo that we have out there. If you look at bacterial viruses, most of them, at least that we know of, have these icosahedral 
head structures, many of them have helical tail structures. So as I mentioned before, icosahedral are nice ways of getting a pretty large volume in a small surface area, small number of proteins. Helices are also very simple because they all pack on top of each other with basically the same protein. Uh, probably the reason that a lot of these bacteriophage have these very elaborate, what are called tail structures to them, is they've got to get through the outside of the cell, which is usually pretty tough. You know, gram negative for all your gram negative, two membranes to get through, and then for the gram positives, you've got this really thick cell wall that needs to be gotten through. However, there are a number of bacterial viruses that don't have these extra tail structures. 5 174 showed you the plaques before. We'll look at it a little bit more detail in just a second. M13, which is this filamentous virus, and then a few viruses which have just RNA genomes up here at the top. Again, my, one of my favorite viruses, not quite my favorite virus, but close. Again, it's bacteriophage T4. This is an electron micrograph of that. Again, it's got the head structure up here together with the tail. Yes, this is the appropriate head, not completely icosahedral, but slightly stretched. And then the tail structure and these tail proteins down here at the bottom. Eukaryotic viruses, most eukaryotic cells are WIMPs. So you don't have nice cell walls on the outside. You ignore the plants for the time being. Certainly um, animal cells. Um, so it's a lot easier for the virus to get its genome on the inside. So often these are either these enveloped viruses, you have membranes around the outside, and what happens is those membranes just fuse to each other. So you have the membrane of the virus, the membrane of the cell, they fuse together, and you release whatever's on the inside. A lot of non-enveloped or naked viruses bind to cell surface proteins. A lot of the cell surface proteins that viruses bind to are important for internalizing things that cells would normally be internalizing, like food, some kind of uh, uh, enzyme, something kind of uh, signaling proteins, something needs to get on the inside. So a lot of viruses will use that process. If you think about how a lot of animal viruses replicate, it's actually not that dissimilar from the way bacterial viruses are replicating. You undergo this lytic process where the virus, let's say a virion comes in, goes through the replication process, bursts open that host, and makes a whole bunch more virions. You also have this, what's called a latent infection in animal viruses, but basically a lot like lysogeny that you get in bacteria. There are a few sort of different processes. It turns out these happen in bacteria as well. Something called a persistent infection. This is actually pretty common in animal viruses. So you have a virus infection that takes place and then virions are constantly produced, but the cell that they've infected continues to produce them. It doesn't die. And this is great from the virus point of view because it's using those resources of the cell in order to make more virions. A couple of cases, um, you also have what's called transformation that takes place. The virus infection that leads to tumor development, that's probably a complete side process. No viruses seem to be replicating this way. And in fact, most of the time when you have a tumor virus, that virus is not being replicated at all. Um, it just, the cells end up going down these, these tumor routes. And again, we can talk much more about that uh, later on if people are interested or again, take my virology course next term. So I want to cover a couple more of the replication processes that happen, some of these bizarre things. We already talked about some of these double-stranded DNA viruses. Let's look at some of the other ones. These are things that are carrying single-stranded DNA and RNA. So the replication process is really kind of an odd one. First one is bacteriophage 5x174. Again, the one that I showed you those nice big plaques for. It takes 12 minutes to go from infection to making more of these virions. Uh, when this, the genome of this virus was first sequenced, people thought it was a message from outer space. In fact, there's a New York Times article that says, you know, message from outer space. The reason for that is that this genome has overlapping open reading frames. It actually uses all three open reading frames on one piece of DNA to make protein, which is really pretty amazing how you can get that to have evolved in the process. But this gets back to the smaller is better. Smaller and simpler is better. You know, the smaller amount of genome you can have, overlapping open reading frames really works pretty well for that. Turns out that 
So this single-stranded DNA gets packaged inside this virus particle. The first thing that has to happen is this single-stranded DNA has to become double-stranded DNA. Because if it can't become double-stranded DNA, there's no way it's going to make messenger RNA and no way that you can make protein. But once it's formed this double-stranded DNA, then through rolling circle, it actually can make lots of single strands, just like what's happening with lambda. And so this is that process right here. You have double-stranded DNA that gets cut. This is by a viral protein. Talk more about this a little bit later on. After that cut, after the break, now you have a 3' end. This 3' end gets extended by the cellular polymerase, and you make a whole bunch of this opposite strand, which then gets re-ligated once you go around. Lots of single strand that gets packaged. So that's how single-stranded DNA viruses make more of their genome. What about RNA viruses? So again, none of the cells use RNA as a genetic material, at least not anymore. Maybe in the RNA world billions of years ago they did. But now it's only the viruses that do that. Well, if you have a positive strand genome that you have inside your bag, once that genome gets released on the inside of the cell, that can be used directly for making protein. It's actually great because you bring that RNA inside the cell, the genome looks just like a messenger RNA. And so now you can make a whole bunch of messenger RNA that makes all of your proteins, which is great. You've got your bag. But what do you put on the inside? Well, you have to get your genome. How do you get your genome? Well, it turns out what you have to do is you have to go through a negative strand. Again, just like for DNA polymerases, RNA polymerases the same way. They only go from 5' prime to 3'. Prime. So in order to make more positive strand, you have to make negative strand as well. Because you then use that negative strand to make more positive strand. Once you've made that, then this positive strand can get put into your bag, made together, or used to make more virus protein. Now this process, going from one strand of RNA to the opposite strand of RNA, and back to that first strand of RNA again, is done through either called an RNA replicase, as they call it in your textbook. Uh, most people call these RNA-dependent RNA polymerases. So they're virus-specific. You only find RNA-dependent RNA polymerases in viruses because they take an RNA copy of the genome, make an antigenome, and then your whole genome, which is going to get packaged. What happens to that RNA? There's a couple of different ways that you can deal with that RNA. Very often, this is true for some of the most common viruses. Actually, any of you have colds right now, so probably the viruses which are causing it, called the picoRNA viruses. This particular example is polio, which hopefully none of you have. Um, but this is the process right here. Just look at the top part of this slide. Here's your polio virus genome. This is what's inside these capsids. Gets made into a negative strand. That gets made into a positive strand. So this is how you make genome. How you make protein is interesting for a lot of these small RNA viruses. The way they do it, they make one ginormous polypeptide. So it turns out that if you look at the genome of all these picoRNA viruses, it's one protein. One start codon, one stop codon. And that gets chopped up into little pieces through viral proteases, which then will lead to how your proteins can get fit together and how they make more of the genome. There are some bigger RNA viruses. The biggest ones, in fact, are these coronaviruses. Coronaviruses, big, bad, nasty coronaviruses. Anybody know of them? Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, but SARS. Any of us old enough to know remember SARS? Um, so also one of these coronaviruses. People didn't think they were a big problem until some of these things came along. Um, turns out that these are so big, their genomes, they're about 30,000 bases in length, that they make these smaller RNAs, which turn out into their messenger RNAs. They have to have a different way of replicating their genomes. I'm um, going to skim through the rest of these replication processes pretty quickly. Again, there'll be a lot more about them in virology next term. Negative strand RNA viruses. Anybody know good at negative strand RNA virus in the news recently? West Africa? Ebola. Influenza. Both of these are negative strand RNA viruses. So negative strand RNA is what comes in. But negative strand RNA is really interesting because you can't use that to make proteins. You have to first 
make positive strand in order to make messenger RNA. So all of these negative strand RNA viruses have to have an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase that comes in with the genome. They have to bring an enzyme with them because you can't make any more enzymes from a negative strand. So they have to have a RNA-dependent RNA polymerase that comes in with them. And that's the target for a lot of drugs because that process, RNA going to RNA, is something very specific to viruses and very specific for any individual virus. In fact, some of you may have heard about the hepatitis C drugs that are currently on the market, ridiculously expensive. Again, totally different story. But most of them are directed against this RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. So, and they're very effective. They're just ridiculously expensive. So um, make your positive strand RNA. That makes your proteins. And then it has to make more negative strand and make more of that. I'll skip over the double-stranded RNA viruses because they're basically just like negative strand RNA viruses. Talk really briefly about these retroviruses. Retroviruses have RNA that gets packaged inside their virus particle, but that gets made into DNA and put into the genome, a lot like what happens with Lambda. The whole process here, I'm not going to go through because it's really convoluted and Baroque, and we're already past 11 o'clock, and your posteriors are probably feeling some of this as well. I wanted to finish up the first part of my talk by mentioning here the genomes of these viruses, the genome size. Here, some of the smallest genomes. These are now single-stranded DNA viruses, less than 2,000 bases in length, up to when this book was written, the megaviruses at 1.25 megabases. But just last year, a new virus was found, what's called the Pandora virus. It's actually almost as big as E. coli. This thing is, is ridiculous. You can see it in the light microscope. And its genome is twice as big as the last one. So it's almost as big as the, you know, certainly not, not quite as big as the E. coli genome, but it's getting close. So some of these are really um, pretty ginormous. So at this point, let's take a quick break, and then we'll talk about some of my research, and then some of the nasty viruses that are currently circulating here and elsewhere. Yeah. Okay, now for the interesting stuff, at least as far as I'm concerned. Uh, I mentioned that T4 is one of my favorite viruses, um, but that pales in comparison to these guys, because these are the, the really interesting viruses. These are the ones that we work on in my lab, and in fact, one of them, um, this one up here that I, in fact, discovered uh, in a hot spring in, in Yellowstone National Park. So <clears throat> this is a really quick overview of archaeal viruses, which again is the real focus of the work that's going on in my lab. These are just amazing in terms of their structures. Uh, one of my favorites in terms of the structures is this one over here um, called the Cidionis bottle-shaped virus. It really does look like a bottle. It's really pretty amazing. Um, also has this ring of things that almost look like birthday candles at one end of it. Um, a Cidionis filamentous virus, this scale bar down here represents 100 nanometers, which is true for all of these guys. Uh, this is almost twice as long as the cell that it infects and has these little nano-sized claws at the end of some of its um, virions that attach to pili. Um, this one, a Cidionis two-tailed virus down here in the middle. Um, this one, on the outside of cells, actually grows tails. And so on the outside of the cell, it's produced as a basically a lemon-shaped particle, and then it grows little tails on the outside of the cell, um, which is really pretty amazing. Turns out that when it grows those tails, the volume actually shrinks. So it's just a conformational change that happens on the outside of the cell. It doesn't require any energy input to do that. So <clears throat> main focus, again, of our work is this one over here. It's the SSV1, or the Spolfaluba spindle-shaped viruses, also known as the Fusello viruses. Fusello is just spindle-shaped. Again, I think they look more like lemons and spindles, but I didn't make up the name. Why do I study them? Um, basically because they're everywhere where you find the appropriate conditions, which is high temperature and low pH. So about 75, 80 degrees Celsius, which is 170 degrees Fahrenheit, pH of 2 or 3. So you find these guys. They have this really interesting shape, again, sort of lemon or spindle-shaped originally. They also have a small 
double-stranded circular DNA genome, which means they're easy to work with and you can do all kinds of interesting things with them. But most importantly, at least as far as this lecture is concerned, is the structure. And this is a um, paper which was just literally accepted about two weeks ago, just came out in print. Um, this is now a higher resolution structure of each of those individual lemon particles, or sort of the Nerf football. The way that this was done is together with a group at University of Texas Medical Branch in Galveston, Texas. Basically, they took lots and lots of pictures, like this one up at the top here in A. These are now viruses which have been frozen in ice. You take many, many of these, and in this case, it was about 900 of them. Average them together in the computer, see what you get. And that's this particular structure right here. This is really interesting for us for a whole bunch of different reasons, but probably the most important of them is this blue thing down here at the bottom, which is the tail structure. This is how that virus is interacting with the cells. Turns out that the surface of the cells that these guys interact with, these are cells that grow in volcanic hot springs, are something called sulfolobus. Those then have a particular surface structure which also has this hexagonal or six-fold symmetry. So it looks as if that tail structure is going to be interacting with this so-called surface layer. So just this structure tells us something about how the virus is probably interacting with the cell. So that was one really interesting aspect of it. The second really interesting aspect of the structure is really the work of my collaborators, and that was how the heck do you make a lemon out of nice simple structures. So normally you've got soccer balls, you've got helices, but how does this stuff actually fit together? Well, so they came up with this really neat model, which is what's shown here in the middle, which is basically two sort of cone-like structures, which are basically taking part of a soccer ball at one end and then really expanding it, stretching it out, and having these other parts of the soccer ball in the middle, putting the two of these together, which approximates this kind of structure. Now, why were people so interested in this? It turns out that HIV-1, the virus which causes AIDS, has a similar kind of stretched out structure. And if you squint a whole lot um, and take one of these, chop off this end, and stack another one on top of it, it looks a little bit like this. Now, squinting a whole lot to do that. Now, unfortunately, the media thinks squinting is really a fine thing to do. So they wrote up a whole bunch of articles about, you know, PSU virologists having HIV-like virus. Well, maybe the structure is a little bit like HIV. And then, you know, may lead to drugs for HIV. Yeah, sure, great. But be careful about the media when you um, get going with these things. I think it could turn out to be something which is really similar in terms of putting together these hexagonal and pentagonal subunits but also could turn out to be something completely different. So we'll have to see. We need to get a lot more data to go beyond that. So that's one of the viruses we're working with. Another virus that we're working with comes from our favorite hunting ground in Lassen Volcanic National Park. This is a place called Boiling Springs Lake. Um, you can see some people right here in the background. Um, those are some of our colleagues also from the biology department here working with some of the thermophilic mosses that grow around this lake. This lake is really fascinating because the low temperature is 50 degrees Celsius, the high temperature is about 95 degrees Celsius, and the pH is 2. So it's not a really good place to go swimming in, which is why we had the engineers build this little boat that we sent out on the lake to go and um, survey and collect some samples. It's an NSF and um, Moore Foundation funded project to look at all of the things which are present inside this lake. We took a particular approach to looking at these called metagenomics, which I don't know if you talked about metagenomics at all yet. So the idea here is that basically you take all of the sequences that you can find in one particular environment and see if from those sequences you can learn something, excuse me, about how all of those sequences are related to each other, which will hopefully tell you something about who's there in that particular environment. So the way that we did this is we separated viruses, basically took all the small stuff, extracted all of those nucleic acids that are inside the bag. We broke down the bag, pulled out the nucleic acids, and then 
made many, many, many copies of these. Because yes, there are a whole bunch of viruses, but it turns out that inside each of those little dots is very, very small amounts of nucleic acid. So you have to make lots and lots and lots of them. So you get a whole bunch of your nucleic acids, you break them into little pieces, and you sequence them. And this sequencing process has been amazing developments, literally in the last 10 years, in terms of getting lots of sequences. And this particular project we did is almost, let's see, 2012, so about five years ago, two generations of technology old at this point. So we got about 400,000 sequences. Then you take all of these sequences and you put them into a computer and you come back a week later or two weeks later and then see which of these have been put together, basically the pieces that overlap. So let's take an example of these blue pieces right here. So these dark blue pieces right in the middle here represent bits of this dark blue piece that then got put together. Then you take all of these pieces together, one bigger piece, which is called a contig, and then compare it to what's known, and that will say, oh, it looks like this blue sequence here looks a little bit like a virus that somebody's seen before, which means that this blue piece may be a similar kind of virus in that extreme environment. The red arrows here represent the hard part of this experiment getting enough of your DNA or RNA and doing this comparison step. So how do you get enough of this stuff? Well, you have graduate students who go out in the field and collect this material. So this is Eric Iverson, current PhD student in my lab, and this is Jeff Diemer, who really spearheaded this um, virus project. And in these buckets is a bunch of sediment that we got out of the lake um, to look at it. So we did all this sequencing, um, and we found a whole bunch of interesting things in there. Now, to start with, the first thing that we found was that of those 400,000 sequences that we got back, compared those again to all the databases, see what we could find, any kinds of, so that last red arrow that I showed you, 90% of those 400,000 sequences matched nothing. So brand new sequence, which is, to start with, really kind of surprising, but on the other hand, it turns out that many people, when they're sequencing viruses, you know, getting out that nucleic acid, most of the time, that sequence doesn't match anything that's out there. So not only are there insane numbers of viruses, like I talked about right at the beginning, they also have this huge amount of genetic diversity that's present in these virus genomes. So very different from each other. But if anything, this is actually kind of nice for Jeff, who was working on this particular project, because he didn't want to analyze 400,000 sequences. It turns out that only about 2,000 of the sequences that he had actually matched known viruses. And that's what's shown basically here. One of the things that we found were a lot of these sequences matched to known archaeal viruses. This B. cauda virus here, that's that two-tailed virus, the one that grows tails at either end. The Lipotrix virus, that's the one that's really long with the claws at one end. There's some other ones in here as well. Turns out we also found some viruses that, sequences I should say, that look a little bit like our Nerf football, our little lemon-shaped viruses as well. We also found a number of single-stranded DNA viruses. Um, and again, this is all in sequence comparison. We put our sequences together and we compared them against everything that people knew about. But we saw one really, really bizarre thing. And that was this thing over here. So we worked really hard to get enough DNA to get sequences from. Now, when we get all these sequences, let me back up um, here again. Uh, once we get all these sequences, we put them all together. Then, through this comparison process, we try and see what things they're most similar to. And we tried, actually, really, really hard to get RNA out of this ecosystem, because we thought RNA viruses from these extreme environments were really, really cool, brand new stuff. Um, and we couldn't find any at all, despite Jeff actually going down to the field four times to try and find some. So we never found anything. But then when we finally got all of our DNA sequences and compared them against known virus sequences, we found quite a few sequences, in this case it was about 40 or 50 of them, that were similar to RNA viruses. Now this was bizarre, because again, we tried to get RNA, and we didn't get any RNA. But then we get DNA sequence, 
and those DNA sequences are similar to RNA viruses. Now, I just told you about how some of these RNA viruses replicate. They go from positive strand RNA to negative strand RNA to positive strand RNA. Is there any DNA in there? Uh-uh. No. And the sequences that these particular DNA sequences were similar to were from those kinds of viruses that are RNA virus, RNA genome, goes to antigenome, goes to regular genome. So not a reverse transcription, none of that going on. So this is really bizarre. And it turns out that Jeff, after finally convincing me, after me telling him he was wrong a whole bunch of times, um, what we figured out was that it turns out that this particular DNA sequence that we found in Boiling Springs Lake, actually what used to be an RNA virus that got stolen by a single-stranded DNA virus, not dissimilar to Phi X174 that I talked about before the break. And the way that we found this out was by putting all those sequences together and seeing which sequences matched up with each other. So that's basically shown here. This green sequence right here represents that gene that was similar to these RNA-only viruses. But what Jeff found is it was on the same piece of DNA, the same virus genome, for, with this protein called a RET protein, a replication initiation protein. This is the protein that when you've got double-stranded DNA in your single-stranded DNA viruses, makes that cut and provides the primer for replication through rolling circle. So what it looks like is somehow, and that's what this big question mark is here, there was a single-stranded DNA virus and a single-stranded RNA virus that infected the same cell at the same time. Magic happened. And these two guys ended up recombining with each other. And this gets back to all those little dots right at the beginning. You remember I said there are so many of these things that really infrequent events will have happened. So this, we think, is an example of one of those really infrequent events, DNA and RNA recombining with each other that has happened and is generating these really pretty brand new viruses that are we're calling a hybrid, some people also call them chimeras, between DNA and RNA. I also like to call this the green pig virus. Reason for that is the RNA virus sequences we found are most similar to plant virus sequences, and that replication protein is most similar to pig viruses. So the heck is this thing infecting? Um, okay, one of these chimeras, with the head of a lion, tail of a snake, um, also with a goat's head coming off of it on the other side. So we don't know. But the fact that you have all of these recombinations taking place actually is potentially somewhat of a problem. And that leads to, see if I can get this to work, um, one <clears throat> process that recombination between different viruses seems to be really important for emergence of new diseases. And if I can get this to work out properly, we'll try and get this to play. Okay, that's a little sooner than we need to be. Uh, I'll, just, I'll just play it from here then. This is, um, how many of you have seen Contagion? Yeah. This is right at the end. Yeah. So this is the recombination process. Um, all gotten their vaccines, et cetera. Um, so we'll just, yeah, I can keep talking about this, the process. But the uh, whole idea here is that uh, you have, and again, here's the, the video itself. Um, it is really very well done in terms of the science, which goes into this. Um, Ian Lipkin who's the scientific advisor for this film, um, has done a lot of virus discovery, has been working on these things um, for years. So this is, the, this is the part right here where uh, he figures out what's going on. <laughs> 
see is there a I'm sure the volume is on here um, the volume on the on the PC but this is yeah basically the the plot is is that there's um, the wife of this guy who's looking at the pictures here um, who gets infected by a virus when she's in Southeast Asia and then brings it back to the United States and spreads it through um, basically a whole lot of the population. It's supposed to be something rather like the SARS um, virus, unlike the viruses which are currently circulating in Western Africa, um, the Ebola virus, but this is much more of a respiratory disease which is spreading through <coughs> the, uh, the populace here. Yeah thought that this DVD would actually work a little bit better here. But um, be that as it may, the, the very end of the film is looking at the process that they think happened, again, here. Because it seems to be a virus which was a recombination that happened between a bat virus and a pig virus, which then made the jump into um, the human population. So it looks as if this is probably not going to work here. So. Um, I'll uh, switch back. Um, no, it's not hooked. It's not. It's it's hooked up here in, in, um, indirectly. But again, the idea is so. The, the very end, what they have is a bat that flies over a farm which has the pigs in it. The pigs then um, get slaughtered, brought to the casino, and then the protagonist of the film here, um, Gwyneth Paltrow, um, meets the cook, and so that's there. Um, they think that's when that process actually took place, which is is reasonable. Um, some of the rest of it's not completely, but it's pretty good. Um, and I like that process. But the other thing that I really like about this film, and it's one of the reasons that I wanted to bring it up here, and again, about getting that actual um, piece there, I'll, it's, yeah, I probably won't be able to post it on YouTube because of the um, copyright thing. But the main thing here is they say, nothing spreads like fear. And so that brings me to, what's this? Ebola. Ebola. Exactly. Now it turns out that this is the original micrograph that was taken um, at the UT Medical Branch about 20 years ago. Um, but of course the reason that we care about it is what's going on here in West Africa. Um, these are the latest numbers in fact from 21st of November. Um, here Sierra Leone, Liberia, and Guinea. Number of cases up to thousands of cases particularly around the capital of Sierra Leone right here. Total number of cases now, again, this is just of as of last week, looks as if, interestingly enough, in Liberia and Sierra Leone, the numbers are coming down. On the other hand, cases in Guinea really seem to be taken off. So um, certainly problematic as far as that's concerned. There's Huge amounts of actually really good information on Ebola. Um, here, this particular one, the case counts where I just got it from. The numbers again, as of last week, 15,319 cases, 5,404 fatalities in Guinea, Liberia, Sierra Leone. Started in March, so it's been quite a few months now. So it was the 25th, so March, April, May, June, July, August, September, October, November, so eight months. Um, there have been four cases been diagnosed in the US. And so when you first look at the numbers here, it's sort of like, okay, where did you get the four from? But anyone who was diagnosed in West Africa and brought here doesn't count in terms of those numbers. And one fatality. Um, in fact, the US is listed, if you go to the CDC website, as being a place where Ebola is circulating. Because we actually have people with Ebola here. Um, or in that incubation period afterwards. Nigeria, Senegal, and Spain, on the other hand, no current cases. So if anything, they're doing better than we are. Uh, Nigeria did a really wonderful case tracing and keeping the outbreak under control. There was one person who came into Nigeria. 20 people ended up coming down with the disease. Eight of them died, but no one else. Senegal won. That person survived. Same thing is true in Spain. So how do you know if you have Ebola? Fever, headache, fatigue, diarrhea, vomiting, stomach pain, unexplained bleeding or bruising, muscle pain. Uh, I have you know, fever, headache, fatigue. Anybody have fatigue? Yeah. So uh, 
that's so, everyone's like, well, do, do I have Ebola? Do I not have Ebola? So, a um, couple of things to think about here. Top things you need to know about Ebola from the CDC. First, dog or cat is not spreading Ebola, so Anna Louise is safe. Um, food and drinks imported into the United States from West Africa are totally safe to eat and drink, unless they're bush meat. That's a different story. But uh, mosquitoes do not carry Ebola. They are the deadliest animals in the world, way more so than 5,000 cases so far in nine months. Family members returning from countries with Ebola do not pose a danger to you unless they're symptomatic. So not a problem. Household bleach and other disinfectants kill Ebola. Wash your hands. Really good. We'll get back to this one. Ebola is not airborne. There's been lots of discussions, media, web, you name it. What happens if it goes airborne? Oh my god, it's going to go airborne. Uh, we've been studying viruses, certainly in terms of you know, medical virology, for at least 100 years. There have been no cases, zero cases, of viruses which are transferred through bodily fluids, like Ebola, that then have switched to becoming airborne. So, sure, it's possible, but extremely unlikely. There also are some physical reasons why it's extremely unlikely that this will actually take place. So that's one reason why airplane travel is really not a problem. Unless, you know, someone vomits all over you while you're on the plane. Which, usually, vomiting occurrences happening on planes have absolutely nothing to do with disease. They're usually food poisoning. Uh, only spread once you have symptoms, but again, you know, symptoms, fatigue, etc. So it turns out that for Ebola spread, it's usually the really nasty symptoms. And in fact, the best way to get infected with Ebola is to bury somebody who's died of it. Because that's where the amounts of Ebola are actually the highest. You can't get Ebola from a handshake or a hug, even with someone who is pretty sick, unless, again, the fluids end up. And they've got to get into a cut, your eyes, et cetera, has to get through these uh, mucous membranes. If you're feeling sick in the US, don't think Ebola. Think flu. So what's this a picture of? Influenza, exactly. So this is electromicrograph influenza up here. And then this is the influenza virion down here. Um, got nine little segments of negative strand RNA. Totally cool process how it replicates. That's not what we're going to talk about for the rest of the time here. This is where influenza is. It's not in West Africa. It's here. These are various different levels. See anywhere in the US where there's no activity of influenza? No. Sporadic, most places. Local, here we are. And this is out for you know, week ending November 15th. If anything, it's going to be higher this week, um, I'm guessing. And then in warmer places, there's actually more of it. If again, you go to the CDC and look at how many people have died, not so much people who have died, but this is kids who've died of the flu in the US. In any given year, it's on the order of 100 in the US of kids who die of influenza. This year, we've already had one, and it's really early in the season. So how many people have died of Ebola in the US? People, total, one. How many kids have died of influenza this year? One. You just look at number of specimens tested. Very small number. Um, CDC does a surveillance process throughout the whole US. Um, they've collected about 10,000 specimens so far. 1,000 of those are positive. And again, if you go back and look at the CDC site, 5% of all deaths reported are due to pneumonia and influenza. Hard to actually say whether a death is particularly due to influenza. But 5% of all deaths in the US, it's a lot. If you look at what viruses are in the vaccine, all of the 2009-like viruses that have been tested so far, and a huge number of them, are in the vaccine. 56% of actually should be H3N2 tested are in the vaccine, and 44% are related. All of the B 
tests that are in the vaccine. What's the Ebola vaccine? Non-existent. How many of you had your flu shot? I don't know your name, so I'm not going to. Uh, flu spreads really well about a meter away from people. So just think about where you are right now. So <laughs> get your flu shot because this is something you can prevent. And this year, it turns out that the vaccine's pretty darn good. Usually it is. The problem that we had with the almost 200 kids dying of influenza, that was because of the 2009 flu that the vaccine was not very good against. It also happened a lot earlier in the particular process. So get your flu shot. It's not too late. There's plenty of it out there. So that being said, let's switch gears a little bit, something a little bit nicer <laughs> finish off with. Uh, genome evolution, they have this whole section in your textbook about how viruses came before cells and how viruses invented DNA. I think this is totally cool and really interesting, but I want to talk more about my stuff instead, so we'll skip it. Uh, <laughs> but what really the question that they're trying to address and talk about that in the textbook has to do with how old are viruses. We know about viral disease, at least in humans, a couple thousand years old. I mean, if you look at some of the Egyptian carvings, there are people who really look as if they've had a polio infection. Smallpox has been known since uh, some of the big cities in the Middle East thousands of years ago. Actually, visualizing virions, we've only seen since the development of the electron microscope in the 1940s. So how old are viruses? So this is a really interesting question. The textbook says, OK, may have been involved before the beginnings of cellular life, may have invented DNA, but we've only seen them since the 1940s. How can we address some of those questions about how old viruses are? Start out with probably my second favorite virus again. This is the Sulfalobus turreted icosahedral virus. It was actually found about half a mile away from this spring. It was nowhere near as attractive as this particular one, so this is the picture we took. Uh, this is a really interesting virus because it looks like a soccer ball, unlike all those other viruses of the archaea I showed you that are sort of more extended, may or may not look a little bit like HIV, et cetera. So this was you know, A, really interesting because it was infecting these particular organisms. But one of the things that our collaborators, um, Jack Johnson and Liang Tang noticed when they made this structure, which again is just like what we did for those lemon-shaped viruses, took lots of pictures of viruses, averaged them all together, um, and got this structure, they noticed that the proteins that fit into the outside of this structure, what make up the bag, are actually really similar between this virus, which infects archaea, sulfalobus, and viruses which infect bacteria, this is a PRD1 virus, and adenovirus, which infects humans. Also, there's an algal virus that looks really similar. So the structures of the proteins down here at the bottom, this is the PRD1 structure, here's the adenovirus structure, basically are identical to the structure down here of our archaeal virus. The sequences of these proteins are completely different relative to each other. So how can this be? How can you have structures that are basically identical to each other, yet have sequences which are completely dissimilar? Horizontal gene transfer, certainly a possibility. But we think it's unlikely because the way that each of these cells work, bacteria, archaea, and eukarya, are so different from each other that it's unlikely that any horizontal gene transfer would actually be functional. Convergent evolution, certainly a possibility. This is just a way that you can make a particular soccer ball-like structure, to have these particular kinds of proteins. But we know that there are other ways to make soccer ball-like structures as well. So we like to think this is evidence for a common ancestor of viruses that infected bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. And that we published this a couple of years ago, but basically it's a little bit easier to see this way. We've got viruses that infect bacteria that have this kind of structure, Viruses that infect eukaryotes that have this kind of structure, and viruses that infect archaea 
that look like this kind of structure. Well, if they did have a common ancestor, it's probably infecting a common ancestor of bacteria, archaea, and eukarya probably billions of years ago. So that's great, but it's really indirect evidence. So that brings me to the last five minutes of my talk, which these are just a whole bunch of links that I, you can check out, um, see things on. But I did want to spend the last five minutes talking about um, something very near and dear to me and something that we're hopefully going to be starting a company to work on. And that has to do with vaccines. Vaccines have saved literally millions of lives. Just last year alone, it's estimated there were six million lives of kids that were saved by normal vaccines. This is a particular vaccination process. Vaccines, however, have a big problem. And that problem is most vaccines, particularly the newer vaccines, have to be kept between 2 degrees Celsius and 8 degrees Celsius. You can't freeze them. You can't heat them up beyond this particular temperature. So why is this a particular problem? Well, as most of us know, power goes out here in Portland. So your fridge dies. So you have to throw away all of your vaccines. But much more importantly, most of the world doesn't have fridges like this. Vaccines get delivered on the back of a donkey. So how do we deal with this problem? How do we get the vaccines out to the people who really need it? Ask T-Rex. Well, why ask T-Rex? What's all this about? Well, this brings me to the work of another PhD student in my lab who's almost done writing up his dissertation, a guy by the name of Jim Laidler, actually Dr. Jim Laidler, um, anesthesiologist who I met in my virology class, his midlife crisis was doing a PhD with me, he decided to look for virus fossils. How old are viruses, and can we find any viruses in the fossil record? We picked bacteriophage T4 because it's got this absolutely wonderful structure. We can make absolutely humongous amounts of it. And basically what Jim said was, well, OK, can I make this into a fossil? And the answer was, we treated it with the appropriate kind of silica concentration. So you can see up the top here, yes, you get a nice silica coating around the outside of bacteriophage T4, which you can see under the electron microscope. These are all pictures taken literally one floor down from right here. Unfortunately, what Jim also found is that when you coat it in silica and left it for too long, you got a blob. And blobs are really a problem as far as electron microscopy is concerned. So it turns out this is probably not going to work for discovering really old viruses. On the other hand, what Jim said was, well, OK, what happens to the viruses once they get this silica coating? And what he saw was, by just doing plaque assays, is what you can see on the left here, is that by coating viruses in silica, you saw this big loss in infectivity. There's our friend bacteriophage T4 on the black line. We've got our lemon-shaped viruses in the middle line. Some viruses actually don't lose infectivity when you treat them in silica. Some, like the vaccinia virus, the smallpox vaccine, really do. But then what Jim found was that process of coating viruses in silica was actually reversible depending on exactly how you do it. And so you can take that virus coated in silica and then take that silica back off in a really very simple process. And what happens, lo and behold, he calls this the zombie virus experiment, you get your activity back. So you can inactivate viruses by coating them in silica and then take that silica coating back off. He also showed that these viruses are actually now very stable to extremes, and the particular extreme that we looked at to start with was drying, taking a virus, drying it out. It turns out if you take any of these viruses, particularly bacteriophage T4 here, you dry it for any period of time whatsoever, zero infectivity whatsoever. If you coat it in silica beforehand, you can keep these guys stable for up to two months. So we think this might be a solution to the freezing and heating process. We know this is true for bacteriophage T4. The immediate question, of course, is, is this important for some of those other viruses that we talked about? We're actually doing some experiments in my lab right now, looking at influenza and yellow fever. There's that other virus that we talked about. Turns out a lot of the vaccines for Ebola are based on some of these things. We're hoping that silica coating will allow us to put the vaccines 
on the back of a donkey so we can get these particular vaccines out to where they're really needed and maybe even save some of those extra million lives of kids who can't get these particular viruses or their vaccines, I should say, any other way. And so that's how T-Rex is hopefully going to solve some of the vaccine problems that we have. So with that, that's the name of the company, which we haven't started yet, but we'll soon.